Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again. Today I want to present part seven of my series on the selected gross pathology of the horse. We're going to talk about some skin disease in the horse. But before I start, as I always do, I want to thank my friends and colleagues who over the last 20 years have provided me fantastic images, which I'm privileged to put together in a lecture to present to you. Now, some very astute pathologists out there have heard a voice in the background of some of these videos. And I guess it's time to introduce you to my producer who helps me put the videos together. This is Miss Smeagol, and this is how she normally is while I'm doing the videos. She's very quiet, she doesn't have much to say, but when I screw up, this is the face that I get, and she lets me hear about it. So if you hear in the background, don't be disturbed. She plays a vital role in the production of these lectures. So let's start with diseases of the skin. We often start in the young animals. Here's a classic condition, which is known as epitheliogenesis imperfecta. We see it in a wide range of species, horses, cattle, ruminants, primates, just about everybody has it. It's a genetic mutation which has been identified in humans as a mutation a compound now named laminin-5, a component of the hemidesmosome. And so if you look histologically at these areas, the entire epithelium has been split from the underlying dermis right through the basement membrane in the middle area which is known as the lamina lucida. A similar defect has been identified in saddlebred foals which are one of the more common breeds to get this particular condition. You can see it anywhere on the body. It's most commonly seen uh, on the legs um, and this skin, it's not that it's not made but it is stripped off during the delivery process. Another very common place that you will see a loss of the epithelium is on the surface of the tongue. Remember that these foals suckle or they nurse in utero. It's more of a, a reflex, but when they rub the top of the tongue against the palate, they will strip the mucosa off of both sides and you'll see focal defects on the center of the tongue and often in the palate. Also look for defects in the epithelium of the esophagus and you may see pitting of the teeth as well in affected animals. Moving on to a disease of younger animals um, and let's look at a couple of infectious diseases. Uh, this is not an uncommon finding. We see this in a number of species besides the horse as well and these cauliflower like hypopigmented growths on the skin, especially of the nose and the lips, are viral papillomas. These in young animals and even in people are self-limiting. They're caused by a papillomavirus and horses have a number of papillomaviruses. This particular one is equine papillomavirus type 1. These viruses are very species specific as to where they infect the animals. So uh, equine papillomavirus type one is the one that you see that causes these lesions around the face. We're gonna talk a fair amount about papillomaviruses in this lecture. They are an emerging condition because of their connection to squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, there may, they may undergo in a number of species uh, transformation from papilloma to squamous cell carcinoma. And there are new papers coming out almost monthly in various species about this particular transformation. So I want you to think in your head now when you see squamous cell carcinoma uh, spontaneously arise, could this have been uh, initially caused by papilloma. That's the way I approach them now. If you've worked with horses just about anywhere in the world, you will recognize this particular lesion as an oral, that's A-U-R-A-L. 
not oral, O-R-A-L, it's in the ear, an oral plaque. Um, these are seen primarily in older animals. We almost never see them in animals less than an age, uh, one year of age. And they're also associated with uh, four distinct papillomaviruses. Equine papillomavirus three, four, five, and six have almost equally been been gone back from these. These are different than the, the papillomaviruses that are caused on the face of young animals, although though they're both proliferative and they're white, um, because these will not spontaneously regress or resolve. And the animal usually has them for the rest of their life. They don't cause any problem. They're probably transmitted from animal to animal by biting flies. Um, and if you, if you work with horses, you're going to see them. Let's stay with the papillomaviruses. And you know we've already talked about one, three, four, five, and six, which leaves two out. We don't want to leave equine cabalis papillomavirus two out because within the last five years there's been a not a tremendous amount of literature linking the formation of papillomas and papillomavirus infection on the external genitalia, both male and female. Uh, horses with the ultimate transformation to malignant tumors. These are papillomas. Uh, they are proliferative growths on the uh, shaft of the penis of this particular horse. And here's a pretty typical uh, subgross histologic presentation. You can see the proliferation of the epithelium. If we got close to it, we may see the formation of coilocytes. Uh, in large cells with a grayish tint to, due to an accumulation of keratin filaments within their cytoplasm. And if you're very lucky on these coilocytes, you will see a intranuclear viral inclusion. And they're often scattered through viral papillomas in a wide range of species, not just horses, but dogs and people and many, many others. And it's one of the diagnostic features we look at on papillomas to identify whether they arise from just chronic self-trauma and epithelial hyperplasia or they are virally induced. Let's get back to the story of uh, the genital papillomas and genital squamous cell carcinomas. Um, there has been a lot of literature linking these being a, when people have gone and and taken biopsies of of squamous cell carcinoma of the penis of the horse, which looks like this. It's an erosive condition which generally affects the glans penis primarily. And you can see that the mucosa is just sort of eroded away. We may look at some other lesions uh, either in the skin or when we get to the reproductive system where you have proliferation of tissue. And you can also consider squamous cell carcinoma as part of the differential, but there aren't a lot of differentials when the tissue of the glans penis has been eaten away. So this is a squamous cell carcinoma, and the literature now says that a significant number of these and also squamous cell carcinoma of the vulva of the females um, possess equine cabalis papillomavirus antigen, suggesting that this also is a malignant transformation from that contagious virus. So we've talked about equine cabalis parvovirus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, and that's all the ones I know of. So we should be done with the papillomaviruses but we aren't. And one of the most common, the most historical and well-known uh, epithelial or, or integumentary tumors in the horse is one that is known as a sarcoid. Okay, sarcoids are largely mesenchymal neoplasms that are caused by a non-productive infection of horses by bovine papillomaviruses, specifically bovine papillomavirus one or two. It's considered the most common skin tumor of uh, horses, and it is generally uh, seen in a number of areas around the eyes, the legs, the trunk, 
and usually what happens is that the animal has a small cut or has scratched himself or a fence post and traumatically inoculated or contaminated this wound with bovine papillomavirus. Maybe, maybe uh, you're running your horses with your cattle and, and they use the same fence post to scratch on or something like that. And then six to eight months down the road, the horse will come down with a proliferative growth at the area of that small wound. It probably also can be transmitted um, by a number of other ways, including uh, veterinary trauma or biting insects. Um, so I don't think that rubbing on fence posts is the only one, but you do almost always have to have some area of trauma into which that uh, the two viruses can be inoculated, one or the other, not both, at the same time. Um, most of them express a very common transforming protein, uh, E5, and that is very important in the pathogenesis because it binds to and activates the receptor for platelet-derived growth factor and sets off signaling cascades, which uh, result in the growth stimulatory single signal for these mesenchymal cells, which cause the formation of these tumors. Uh, this particular protein also downregulates uh, major histocompatibility one expression. So these tumors often for a long time will evade immunosurveillance. There are a number of different classifications which don't mean much to me as a diagnostic pathologist. They're mostly uh, gross uh, appearances, but they sort of all act the same. These are uh, somewhat locally aggressive. They don't metastasize, but you'll hear people talk about uh, occult ones where you really don't see much except some roughened skin. Um, the entire tumor is underneath and doesn't really form a mass. Um, the verrucous or wart-like ones are, as the, uh, the name says, they are pedunculated, sort of cauliflower-like masses. And then you have the fibroblastic type, which looks like uh, a proud flesh. We're going to look at proud flesh in a minute as a differential. Um, these are very fleshy, fibrous, large nodules. They're often ulcerated. Um, and then finally, you can have mixed types. Um, they don't really, that doesn't really mean much to a, a pathologist. One of the conventions now that we use at the Joint Pathology Center is that, and this has been published in a number of papers out of the University of Florida, in that histologically, these are almost impossible to tell from uh, peripheral nerve sheet tumors. Cells look very much alike. Um, both of these tumors stain for bovine papillomavirus 1 antigen on immuno. Um, and so unless they show very characteristic classic signs of uh, sarcoid in their interaction with the epithelium, the so-called picket fence, we often will say in the diagnostic letter that this is a mesenchymal neoplasm and it could represent either sarcoid or a, a benign peripheral nerve sheet tumor. However, the treatment for both is pretty much the same, so um, it doesn't really make that much difference. I would say probably about 30 to 40 percent of the time now we diagnose the sar it is sarcoid, um, especially those of us who've been doing it for quite a long time. Uh, old habits are hard to break. And then the other 60 percent just can't tell, so we give a letter that says that it could be one or the other, but it shouldn't make any difference as term to treatment. So enough about sarcoids, but it's a big problem in uh, horses in terms of neoplasia and other uh, equids as well. You can see them in the zoo and the zebras, uh, and any type of, of, of equid can get that. Okay, while we're talking about sarcoids, I want to uh, uh, at least show a couple of differential diagnoses. Um, because they may pop up at a similar location. Here's a lesion at the commissure of the lips that could be an ulcerated sarcoid. It's a place where an animal might, might scratch. And uh, so your differential for this particular lesion would have to include sarcoid, but 
this is a case of habernomiasis. Remember we talked about habernomiasis in the first lecture on the GI system because habernema is a, uh, a helminth or a nematode parasite which lives in the mucosa of the stomach. Uh, hopefully you'll remember this particular uh, picture. Here is the Margo placatus with the squamous part of the stomach, the glandular, and you'll find these worms along with their cousins, Drachia megastoma, right there at the Margo placatus. These live sort of free, embedded in the mucosa, and they don't form the large brood pouches like Drachia does, although they're closely related spirurid nematodes. Now, the larva of these worms are transmitted by flies, by house flies or stable flies, um, which often turn up on the horse in areas where there is some, uh, some water. So around the eyes, uh, around the lips, maybe in around the genitalia where it's moist and the fly takes, you know, a little meal of the water or the tears or the moisture. Um, and in doing so, we'll deposit larva of the fly on the area in which it's standing. Now, there's a couple of possibilities for these larvae. Um, if they are on the lips, then they can migrate into the mouth, um, in which they will, they will get into the gingival crevices and ultimately make their way down to the stomach where they will mature and the life cycle continues. In just about any other spot around the eyes, uh, on the legs, uh, on the, uh, the genitalia, the larva will penetrate the mucosa and they will cause a condition um, of eosinophilic and granulomatous inflammation that looks like this. You see these sort of yellowish granulomas. The, the yellow, the yellow uh, coloration comes from the large number of eosinophils. They are often mineralized, so they will be sort of caseous or gritty granules. Uh, pythium might be a rule out, which we'll talk about in just a minute. But the lesion looks like this. Um, the lesion is a result of a hypersensitivity reaction to the dead or dying larva. And often this lesion will recur in the same horses every summer. So your rule outs for this are going to be sarcoid and then uh, uh, pythiosis or phycomycosis as some people call it. But it is just a reaction to the presence of the dying larva which never made it into the gastrointestinal tract. And so let's move on to another differential for these ulcerated masses, but one that is primarily seen from the, essentially, the legs downward. And this is cutaneous uh, pythiosis, although you have to consider cutaneous zygomycosis as well. These often tend to be larger, more ulcerated, chronic lesions in animals that often have access to water. Pythium insidiosum is from the class of oomycetes, which are primitive organisms which require decaying uh, aquatic plants um, or damaged organic tissue and animals for its normal life cycle. It's most often seen in sort of warm, moist climate. So we tend to see it more in the wetter parts of the southern U.S., like Florida or Louisiana. It's most often seen in summer and fall. When temperatures are warmer and you have more rotting plant material in the water. You can find these lesions anywhere, but they're most commonly seen on the distal extremities. They are probably the result of traumatic inoculation or at least 
a wound. The animal goes into the water that contains these oomycetes um, with an open wound. The reason we see it on the legs primarily is that's what goes in the water. Also, you may see it on the back of the elbow from animals that have a gait abnormality, so they are overreaching or they kick um, and they cause a small wound around the, uh, the fetlock. And so that's what will become infected. Although Pythium, from time to time, primarily in dogs, you can see uh, ingestion and uh, infection of the intestine as well. But in horse it is, horses, it is primarily a, uh, uh, a disease of trauma to the skin. The lesion is, is classic, it's large, it's chronic. It is a pruritic lesion, so the animals will rub it and make it even worse. Um, Self-mutilation be, can be considerable in these animals. And one of the things that contributes to the pruritus is the large number of eosinophils that you will see in this particular condition. It's not what you normally think about with uh, fungal infections, but horses throw a lot of eosinophils, and when you get a lot of them together, they can be extremely pruritic. They're mixed in with granulomatous inflammation, and it's a chronic active lesion. I don't use that term very much. To me, chronic active lesions are those in which you have a tremendous amount of fibrous connective tissue but because this inflammation has been going on. And then you have these little hot spots, in this particular case, little hot spots in which you will see lots of eosinophils, uh, epithelioid macrophages, and if you look very closely, because on H&E you really can't see these organisms, but you can see their negative outlines within the areas of inflammation. Back in the day before we had uh, immunohistochemistry uh, or especially PCR, I used to think and kid myself that I could tell the difference between uh, Pythium, Zygomyces, and in dogs and cats, Legionidium. Um, but you can't. You really can't. They're all about the same size. They look identical. They cause these identical um, chronic active lesions. So when you see this, this is one. If you want the definitive diagnosis, then you need to send it off for either culture um, or for PCR because you just can't tell the difference on h and &E. I've learned a lot over the last 30 years and things that I thought as a young man I could tell the difference. I've learned by a hard experience and being wrong a lot that I couldn't. The other one that uh, has caused me problems over the years is histo versus sporthrix. Sporthrix is supposed to be shikar shaped and I've seen histo do that way and and uh, histo certainly is not always the really nice round uh, types that we tend to see in textbooks and in VISPO and the ones they slide conference. Okay so enough about Pythium. Pythium is a it is an interesting uh, uh, condition. Um, you often will get these uh, large uh, crusty spots which represent the active areas of inflammation. Um, they form these branch-like structures which have been referred to as, by a lot of names um, back in the day when Pythium was referred to as swamp cancer. Um, and these particular structures, which are basically a combination of uh, inflammatory debris and some mineral and the fungus or the oomycete itself have been referred to as cunkers or leeches or bursatii, whereas the condition of pythiosis has been referred to as phycomycosis, phycomycotic granuloma, hyphomycosis, Florida horse leeches, um, granulomatous or granul granular dermatitis, or destruens equi. That's a lot of names for this one particular condition. And then to finish up this little subset of proliferative dermal lesions in the horse, um, this is one that once again your differential diagnosis is going to be, or at least include, sarcoid or uh, pythiosis. It is a lesion that is most commonly seen on the distal legs, could be the front or the back legs. And this is known as exuberant granulation tissue or proud flesh 
in horses. Okay, it's usually, it's not always seen here. You can also see it on the underside of horses, on the prepuce, um, but on the legs, the contributing factor to its development, there has been a wound here, and the wound has not epithelialized. Um, this is a large mass of granulation tissue, which is growing faster than the epithelium around the edges can cover it up. The contributing factors, um, which is why this shows up most often in the limbs, is that down there you often have a, a tremendous amount of movement. Um, you have minimal soft tissue, and then you have poor circulation of drainage, all which contribute to an inability to re-epithelialize these wounds. And if you've ever worked with horses and had to deal with these, these can be a very difficult uh, condition to ever heal properly. And you can get scarring, which limits mobility, and you don't want to limit the mobility on the distal limb of a horse when these animals are injured first you try to get granulation tissue to heal these wounds which can be somewhat devastating i once worked on a horse that just about cut off one of the bulbs of its feet on some concertina wire and uh, i couldn't wait for the granulation tissue to grow in so um the i knew that the animal would eventually be be salvaged um but then when that granulation tissue started uh, it just was the devil to get this to re-epithelialize. There are a lot of, uh, or at least used to lot, be a lot of uh, medicants on the market which said that they would decrease the amount of granulation tissue, but boy, that was. I think I, uh, I came into an assignment uh, to, and the animal injured itself like within the first day or two, and I left that assignment two and a half years later. Still, managing the wound. So it can be a real problem in horses. So don't un underestimate the problem of uh, proud flesh in the horse. Okay, so as we finish up on some of the infectious diseases in a horse, um, Uncacerca, another filarid parasite, is commonly seen all over the world in horses. Um, the microfilaria concentrate generally in the skin of the ventral midline, but you can see uh, large numbers of these in a lot of other areas, including the face and the neck and the uh, chest, the withers, the four legs, the abdomen, just about anywhere. And not all individuals respond uh, in the same way to the presence of uh, the microfilaria of Oncocerca cervicalis as others. Some areas, uh, some animals you may get tremendous pruritus with formation of ulceration and crusts and ultimately when they heal you will get alopecia and depigmentation. The, uh, the condition is probably very similar to that of summer sores um, which is a, a hypersensitivity um, especially type 1 and then type 4 to the presence of the dead and dying microfilaria. Um, you can also, uh, because Oncocerca cervicalis has been associated with uh, pole evil or fistulous withers, that may be a, uh, that may just have been an association because we know that those particular conditions are bacterial in nature. Whether Oncocerca cervicalis, which may insist, in the ligamentum nuchae is a cause of that is is probably not uh, well worked out. Um, Polyval and fistulous withers, um, which we will see when we get to the musculoskeletal system, um, are generally bacterial infections once associated with brucella, now more commonly associated with uh, strep equi. And one other lesion that you may see in association with Oncocerca is not in the skin but is in the eye and you will see areas of depigmentation um, at the limbus of the eye and the peripheral iris where you'll see these little white blotchy areas associated with uh, uh, ocular migration of the uh, filarid parasites that cause uh, onchocerciasis.
Oh, one other classic lesion of Anka Circa that I forgot to mention is the presence of a pigmented circular area that looks like a bullseye. It's really just a plaque, but a bullseye in the center of the forehead. And that's supposedly very highly suggestive Anka Circa. Not one that I've seen a lot, but these areas of uh, alopecia and hypopigmentation are pretty common in parasitized animals. Okay, let's move on to lumps underneath the skin of horses. Um, this can be a very confusing, and there are many different names and many different types of non-ulcerated bumps underneath the skin of horses. They're often due to uh, either an hypersensitivity reaction or some form of uh, autoimmune disease. Um, this is one that is fairly characteristic, and you can see that these are wheels, which are all along the skin of this animal. They are just localized areas of swelling uh, as a result of type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. You can call these urticaria or hives, and there are a wide range of causes of these in the horse. Drugs are probably the most common cause of urticaria in the horse, but other causes uh, include uh, high levels of grain in the diet. Some animals will get them uh, as they will get them uh, in the post exercise period. Even dermatographia, just uh, like raking your fingernails or a stick along the side of the animal, and some, some animals will result in a swelling of the skin underneath due to the uh, compression of mast cells and the release of histamine which causes uh, contraction of endothelial cells, loss of fluid into the, to the surrounding tissue, and resulting swelling. Um, they've been associated with uh, uh, stinging insects or certain plants like stinging nettles or the application of uh, certain chemicals which we don't use anymore um, like carbolic acid or turpentine which uh, or, or uh, uh, chemicals which were used to uh, uh, supposedly uh, increase the vascular vascularity around the joints a sort of chemical firing so to speak luckily that is hardly ever used uh, anymore, at least in uh, uh, countries who treat their animals well. Um, some of these animals may have concurrent uh, uh, inflammation of the intestinal mucosa, resulting in uh, severe constipation as well. We're going to look at uh, one or two uh, immune mediated diseases in horses which may present like this in the very early stages. But urticaria are known for coming on suddenly and then dissipating over a number of hours. And then you just have to figure out what the trigger is for the particular horse. Well, we get into the nodules, and a lot of these um, can resemble each other histologically. And often uh, it, clinicians will make a diagnosis unseen just by where these particular nodules often aggregate. Um, one of the ones that are often seen up around the pole, around the girth of horses, are these uh, hard nodules which occasionally will ulcerate. They're non-paritic, they're non-painful, and these have gone by a number of names in the past, including the very poorly chosen nodular necrobiosis. Um, but today we call them uh, nodular collagenolytic granulomas, and that really describes the histology very nicely. Not the pathogenesis, but um, these are focal nodules of eosinophilic and granulomas inflammation in which the collagen has a lot of uh, splendora hoplia, brightly eosinophilic material lay down upon it um, uh, and which is probably the result of the major basic protein from the degranulated eosinophils and so it forms these bright red club-shaped flame figures um, look very much like eosinophilic 
or at least linear granulomas in cats. Um, people we call these foci of collagen degradation don't know if that's exactly true or they're just being covered with this Splendora Hopley material. Some people have said that uh, in the in the the areas where you see one focal nodule that it might be an immunologic response to uh, hypodermic needles and a silicone silicone coating um, but you often see animals with a number of these nodules so you know people say well maybe then it's insect bites or trauma because of the location you know often around the girth or under the saddle um, so we really don't know what causes this in the horse, but they're well documented and not too difficult to. Um, but a number of other things can look like these. Uh, another lesion that looks very much like this is a mast cell tumor in a horse. Now mast cell tumors, they, they do have a very characteristic appearance. This is what they would look like grossly. They may be even larger. Um, but what you will see in mast cell tumors, nothing else really looks like a good mast cell tumor, are these huge lakes of uh, degranulated eosinophils, uh, just bright red areas of devitalized tissue surrounded by macrophages. And if you are lucky, you're going to spot some foci of mast cells in there. They're not going to be in every slide. So a lot of times you look at it and you won't see the mast cells or, or you see something that might look like a mast cell and they don't jump that out, out at you nicely like they do in the dog or the cat. So when you see these areas of nodular necrobiosis or, or collagenated granulomas, always think really quickly and it's good to get multiple sections so you, you can make sure that you're not dealing with an equine mast cell tumor. Uh, a little further down you will see other types of eosinophil granulomatous nodules. Um, these are called girth galls because this is where the the girth or the strap for the the saddle goes and uh, they also are nodular areas they don't have uh, uh, ulcerated surface and so this is known as equine axillary nodular necrosis. They look very much like the collagenated granulomas except these don't have those areas of collagen degradation. Another rule out for something like this would be cutaneous amyloidosis, at least grossly. Histologically cutaneous amyloidosis is something that you can uh, put a Congo Red on. You'll figure it out pretty quickly. Even without that, you'll, you'll if you are familiar with the condition, you shouldn't have too much trouble diagnosing this. The cutaneous amyloidosis tends to be a little bit larger. They can range up to 10 centimeters in diameter, but it's another well-circumscribed papule or nodule or plaque that you can see just about anywhere on the front half of the animal. They may start out looking like urticaria. They may regress. Um, or they may recur or have a chronic progressive course. So that's cutaneous amyloidosis. So um, when you are looking at these grossly, it's really a guess, maybe an educated guess, but a guess nonetheless. And, and all of these should be biopsied so you can figure out the best course of treatment for these particular animals. Now, horses are subject to true autoimmune diseases, but they're fairly uncommon. The most common one that we see in the horse is pemphigus foliaceus. We looked at, at another one when we were looking at the uh, first lecture, the oral cavity, first lecture in the GI series, and that was a bullous pemphigoid, which tends to cause large, tense, hard, blisters in the mouth. Well, pemphigus foliaceus is one that often starts at the coronary band and you see these erosions or ulcerations of the coronary band and this flakiness. Um, about 50% of these animals at the onset of disease will have concurrent systemic clinical signs and then the disease will become generalized over the face and the limbs and they will get this general scurfiness or scruffiness um, uh, throughout the body. 
uh, Appaloosas may be uh, predisposed to this uh, in the horse world. And because it's pemphigus foliaceous, um, it does share a common antigenic target with uh, humans and dogs. And, and the target in this particular disease is uh, a, a member of the cadherans called desmoglein 1. Once again, it's a prominent component of desmosomes. Um, so, so what happens is the cells within the epithelium will uh, lose contact with each other. Uh, the keratinocytes will, will split and remember, whenever epithelial cells lose contact with each other and they become isolated, they die. So you will get the formation of vesicles and acanthocytic keratinocytes, or dead, rounded up keratinocytes, within these, uh, uh, within these blisters. The binding of the antibodies to desmoglein 1 stimulates the secretion of a urokinase type plasminogen activator, which then activates plasminogen, resulting in damage to the desmosomes. That's a pathogenesis, but in most cases, if you can keep the, the different uh, uh, autoimmune diseases and various species straight with the antigen, I think that that's probably as good as anything else. So this is desmoglein 1. One of the problems with uh, uh, treatment of this, which involves corticosteroids or other immunosuppressants as the horse is often founder. Uh, and you do have this damage at the coronary band. So um, laminitis is a, a not uncommon sequela in uh, this particular condition. Okay, another condition. Now this could very well be, um, but the, the coronary bands look pretty good. This could very well be one of those pemphigus foliaceous horses because they will end up, as I said, being very scurfy, a lot of hyperkeratosis and ulceration. So um, when I look at this, a very skinny horse as well, um, I, I've got to think about autoimmune disease. Uh, you could probably consider the possibility of this is a neglect case and we have uh, eat some of the dermatophytes or maybe dermatophilosis, but uh, this actually is a horse with another autoimmune disease that goes by an acronym of MEAD. And it stands for Multisystemic Eosinophilic Epitheliotropic Disease. And it is a condition in which uh, eosinophils invade the uh, epithelium of multiple organ species, including the GI tract, the respiratory system, and ultimately the skin. And so uh, biopsies of the gut um, will give you a tremendous number of eosinophils which largely crowd into the mucosal lining. Um, you'll see formation of eosinophil granulomas in multiple organs, including the pancreas and the salivary glands. And in the respiratory tract, it tends to affect the airway epithelium. Um, because of the uh, nature of the intestinal insult, which is often the first insult, these animals generally uh, present with severe weight loss. And you can see how skinny this animal is. Um, you can find eosinophils and lymphocytes and plasma cells within the skin like you can in most other organs that have some epithelium in them. Some people say, well, it's not really uh, a primary skin disease, um, but the changes in the skin and the hyperkeratosis and the scurfiness and the loss of hair is probably the result of the pre-existing gastrointestinal damage, which uh, essentially causes poor nutrition to the skin. And that's a possibility at all. But it's considered an exfoliative dermatitis of unknown etiology. Uh, and that's multisystemic eosinophilic and uh, epitheliotropic disease. Essentially, eosinophils and granulomatous inflammation in any organ that has an epithelial lining, including that of the reproductive tract, in some mares as well. Another autoimmune disease 
um, that is poorly understood in a number of animals, uh, including horses, dogs, and people, is vitiligo. Um, there is no hyperkeratosis associated with this. Um, there may be alopecia, or simply the hairs may turn white. And uh, uh, vitiligo is a hypomelanosis, a melanocytopenia, which is characterized by uh, destruction of melanocytes and gradually expanding uh, macules of hypopigmentation. And they generally occur over a uh, several months to a year period and then they stop. And it often occurs in older animals, um, middle-aged or older animals. It's not something that is congenital. The animals may look perfectly normal at birth and then develop these expanding areas of hypopigmentation and occasionally alopecia. There are a number of theories and nobody really knows what causes this disease. Um, people say that it's an autoimmune destruction of melanocytes. Uh, there is a, uh, uh, a theory that says that the production of melanin itself is a toxic product and that these animals have a, a sort of congenital uh, lack of protection against the accumulation of these toxic metabolites of, of melanocyte uh, production. It doesn't really uh, explain why it doesn't affect the whole body or it doesn't affect the, the younger animals. Um, and then uh, there's a third neuro, neurochemical theory that suggests that there is chemicals that are released from peripheral nerves in the area which inhibit the formation of, of melanin. Um, I sort of subscribe to the autoimmune theory but uh, that's one that still needs to be worked out. Uh, but it's been identified in, uh, as I said before, dogs and, and obviously humans. Uh, also cats and cattle have been afflicted with this. You know, unsightly but not terribly significant condition. Oh, this one snuck in here. And uh, it's ticks. Uh, and I usually don't put a lot of parasites in these lectures, but um, horses, and uh, ruminants and pigs, but especially horses, can be afflicted by the spinos ear tick. It's a very large tick, as you can see here, and the uh, the Latin name is Otobius magnini, and they get down in the ears of horses, um, and they are a constant, as you can imagine, a constant source of annoyance and irritation they can cause, ulceration of the inner ear with their attachment and their scrabbling around. Um, you can get uh, otitis externa and o otitis media and animals will often flick their head and rub it against the fence posts and ulcerate and excoriate their ears. Um, they're usually seen in the arid environments of the southwestern uh, U.S and you will see uh, uh, the larvae and nymphs uh, within the ears and the adults actually live off the host um, often in crevices and fence posts and under logs and then uh, uh, the eggs are laid on or near the ground and then when they hatch the uh, larva and the nymphs will crawl up fence posts to get to places where they think they can uh, get into the ears of horses. So this is Otobius magnini, and uh, just uh, it really, I feel bad for these animals because they have to be absolutely miserable. Makes my ears itch when I think about it. Okay, let's finish up the this lecture on the skin with the Tumors of the skin that we have not already covered, we have covered sarcoids, we've covered squamous cell carcinomas, um, but a couple very common ones that we don't see, and one is melanoma. Here's a big melanoma which is filling the exterior ear canal of this particular horse. I want you to note the color of the horse. Um, there are not a lot of papers that have been written um, on how to differentiate melanocytomas from melanomas. Here at the JPC, we call them all melanomas. Um, but the question is usually not how many mitotic figures you see, 
or the anisocaryosis or the cellular features, but uh, more important happens to be what color is the horse. Uh, horses with the graying gene, like liposomers, um, tend to be able to carry a large load of these neoplasms. They can even disseminate into internal organs. The animals will just, when they finally succumb, um, they will be just riddled with these tumors. Whereas brown, the pro progression of the condition in brown horses or black horses is much more uh, rapid, much more severe, and they don't take a very big load of these tumors. One of the things that you often see in these grayish horses is that they will begin around the uh, uh, perineum, the distal hind limbs, or the genitals. They work their way up the tail. We're looking at the tail here. You can see the, the uh, apaxial musculature of the tail, and you can see not uncommonly these will just sort of make a pathway up into the distal spinal cord and, and really show very little clinical signs as long as it's a gray horse. And that is absolutely key. Another very interesting uh, tumor that's been around for a long time has gone by a lot of names. Uh, one of the first papers were published in the mid 80s on this where it was called the histiocytic lymphosarcoma, which is sort of a, yeah, that's a, one of those things like jumbo shrimp. It doesn't make any sense. You can't have a histiocytic lymphosarcoma. Um, but these are uh, subcutaneous non-epitheliotropic lymphomas, which uh, now because we classify most of our lymphomas uh, not by their location in the horse, but by their phenotype or immunophenotype. These are the most common T-cell rich B-cell lymphomas in the horse. They're often seen in thoroughbreds. And they're most commonly seen in female horses. One of the most interesting parts about this is that these neoplastic cells, which form these non-ulcerated subcutaneous nodules, which tend to wax and wane in individual animals, have progesterone receptors. So they tend to go away when the animal becomes pregnant or when the animal uh, develops an ovarian tumor. You don't really want that. But uh, so in the presence of elevated levels of progesterone, the tumors will actually shrink. Then they'll come back when the horse delivers a foal or the tumor is removed. They usually re they arise along the lymphatics. And they're very superficial. They don't often uh, involve the deep dermis. But the history that you want is that the animal has multiple nodules, has had them for a while. And when you look at it, you'll see a combination of lots of T cells and the big B cells, which are the neoplastic cell, which were identified before the use of immunohistochemistry as epithelioid macrophages. That's sort of what they look like. Um, so don't mistake it for inflammation on histo. Always ask for a, a good history, especially when you're involving one of these nodules from a female thoroughbred horse. Okay, we, we talked about some of the foot diseases when uh, earlier on under uh, vascular. We're going to talk about some uh, later on, like laminitis, when we get to musculoskeletal. But uh, some of the, the diseases of the superficial parts of the hoof, I want to mention one in general. This is one that takes a while to, uh, to develop, it goes through a number of stages, but it's seen in animals that usually report husbandry, often wet environments. And this is a condition that is known to farriers and vets as canker. It is a painful, chronic hypertrophic pododermatitis primarily affecting the frog and then will spread into the sole and if unchecked will affect the hoof wall. We see it most commonly in draft breeds. We see a lot of these uh, distal leg injuries in draft breeds because they are very heavy. Um, they, they do uh, support a tremendous amount of weight on their hooves. And this particular condition, like so many diseases of the feet in our large animals, is associated with numerous bacteria, um, a lot of anaerobes and fusobacterium, which is omnipresent in the environment, uh, some treponemes. In some cases, they've uh, identified even bovine papillomavirus 1 and 2, which are the ones that cause sarcoid in. But it's almost always involved in a wet environment and poor sanitation. Here's an early case. We don't have a lot of proliferation 
we have just a foul smelling uh, painful nasty wound which right now is uh, mostly confined to the frog over time you will get this uh, sort of proliferation of the frog as it encroaches upon the sole you'll see that these white papilliferous projections um, which resemble like soft cauliflower and this is the hypertrophic nature of the frog and the sole reacting to the chronic bacterial uh, infections okay well that covers at least some of the diseases it's not encyclopedic of all of the diseases of the horse we skipped some of the ones that, that are, are sort of self-explanatory we've covered another species like dermatophilosis uh, also known as streptothrichosis we've we didn't cover those um, but I think that this covers a lot of the very interesting diseases of the skin in the horse uh, in our next lecture we're going to look at the musculoskeletal system which will hit some uh, some diseases that often will uh, show some cutaneous signs as well so there's a little bit of skin left for future lectures well I want to thank you for hanging with uh, with Miss Smeegs and I this morning she seems to be very happy over there sleeping on her heating pad so I guess I did a a, a fairly good job today hopefully she won't give me a lecture on the way home as always uh, I wish you a fantastic day and I hope you enjoy wonderful health with it and I look forward for you to come back to the Foundation's YouTube channel again for more lectures on the horse or maybe you're interested in one of the other species. There's a lot of information there and I hope you're enjoying listening to it as much as I'm enjoying putting it out there. Uh, thanks so much and have a great day.